Good morning. Can I move this technology? <laughs> I'm what you call an old labor type. I work for notes. <laughs> Good morning. I'm delighted to address such a distinguished audience and indeed to be back here in Reykjavik when I walk outside and see the trawlers. It reminds me of the Cod War that took place between the United Kingdom and Iceland and my involvement and the interventionist policy to which you're concerned about. <laughs> I really want to make my contribution as a politician from my own background and experience that is relevant to trying to implement many of the norms and uh, policies that you want to be brought about and the political difficulties sometimes in achieving it. That's not an apologist argument. It's simply one that I want to reflect to you of somebody who's been actively involved in many of these issues. And I go back a long period of time to being a trade unionist, a seaman for 10 years, and indeed, funny enough, that gave me a great deal of experience, not least of all, meeting some of the leaders. I was a waiter on ships and liners, and indeed, I was the waiter to Anthony Eden at the Suez Affair. I had to make clear to him I thought he was bloody wrong in what we did at the Suez. Put him off his foie gras, but I made my point. I then also uh, the, uh, met Macarius in Cyprus in the early days when they were fighting for freedom from Britain, its colonial power. So in a way, somebody in early in my life, I began to experience the fight for justice, because that's what it's really about, human rights. It's about justice, internationally, nationally, individually, and you are talking about the framework in which you can achieve that. To me, of course, the uh, definition uh, and, and also I could say it will reflect my life as uh, a member of parliament for 40 years dealing in the national legislation on human rights as a deputy prime minister for 10 years under the Tony Blair government in what some people refer to as the sofa government where the two of us sit on a sofa and talk about the difficulties and some very illuminating situations like the Americans and Britain over Iraq which I'll come back to in a second but you began to see how countries come to different decisions about achieving these matters and what motivates them and of course an active involvement in human rights at issues at a home and abroad. I don't have to define human rights, it's already been done in some excellent contributions this morning and indeed from a minister who laid it out that framework. In fact I sat there sometimes thinking have I committed criminal acts being involved in some of these decisions but that is the nature of the politician is to find some framework of which you can get consensus and agreement. It's all right having the perfect world but if it doesn't work that way, as Cyprus has just been pointing out, and I was actively involved in that situation in the British government, if you don't get the agreement, if a security council says, I'm sorry, one or two members, we're not going to allow that to happen, do you then take unilateral action? Because that's at the heart of this argument, and I want to pose some of the questions that are actually involved in that. Um, and therefore, I must tell you, it's much easier to get national agreements than it is to get international ones. Uh, as the lead negotiator in the climate change negotiations at Kyoto on the climate change, I can tell you getting agreement for 46 nations is far better than 196 nations. And that raises the whole question of the UN and the actual way the UN can work and how sometimes it's neutralized as we've just heard. So as a seafarer, my first examples, of course, was a strong trade unionist, was operating in an industrial field that where I disagreed with the captain, I was accused under the old Merchant Shipping Acts of the 19th century of committing an act of mutiny. And when you disagreed, you were fined and there were sanctions. Now clearly that was unjust. And I, my first life before I became a member of parliament was to fight for that. And then I became a member of parliament and changed the laws of the Merchant Shipping Acts, affecting many thousands of seafarers and fishermen. And that was about human rights. It wasn't called human rights then. It was called an industrial rights, the right to be able to disagree, to play a part in the environment in which you operate. And we were able to achieve that. And indeed, the whole business of human rights the European Convention of Human Rights affects 47 members, and I hope to show you that the continental influence, in this case the European Union, can have an effect on developing the human rights uh, development internationally. And that's because Europe is such a big influence in these matters. And indeed, that Convention of Human Rights is much more specific 
and more comprehensive than the UN Declaration. And of course, that's the one that operates within the European framework. As a government, of course, when we first came in, the Blair government in 1997, one of the first things we were to do was not only as we were one of the original members to the European Convention on Human Rights, we made it clear now that as domestic legislation, we would make the, uh, the Human Rights Convention actually superior to our domestic legislation. Or indeed, that any claim about human rights within that European framework could now be done through our domestic courts. I think that was an important development. But you never quite know the consequences of it. Some of you may be aware that one of the major uh, consequences was our press began to claim that the human rights was undermining press freedom. There was always the assumption, particularly by editors of papers, who were a law unto themselves, particularly in Britain, that somehow any decision about a personal or a private right or a human right, or that's a, agreed by convention, should be decided by the editor and not the courts. That they were far better to judge what was the public interest. And that had led, of course, to a big battle in Britain that we're still in the process of, where indeed we have to see um, what had happened. We had the hacking. My phone was hacked. 76 journalists were arrested, despite them telling us it was a rogue journalist. We now write at the top in the media, they were exploiting and abusing the human rights. They didn't see it as that. They felt they were the believers uh, and the implementers of a human rights judgment in all regard uh, to the uh, to the, their interpretation of it. And that's why in Britain there's been a real problem about a press complaints commission, which in Europe supposed to be an independent body, but was allowed to be controlled by the press. Hence, we've had all these problems now about human rights, about the abuse of human rights by our own press. Even the Leveson inquiry was in a public inquiry to see the extent of the abuse of the human rights and people's rights was underway. They, they exposed that it was even greater, right at the top of the industry itself. Parliament then agreed overwhelmingly to back its recommendations. We now have the press telling us we're not going to accept that. Well, that's going to be interesting. That, ba that battle continues. And indeed, I took the police, the Metropolitan Police, and indeed the... Um, uh, the police and indeed the press to court using the human rights argument on section 8 and 9 about privacy and indeed was able to win my case. So this framework of human rights, this constant battle is continuing in all our countries and it's important that it does. And even if I say it's easier to get it nationally, it's still with great difficulties anyway, but you must recognize the principles are right adjust your legislation to achieve it and be very clear this is what you as parliamentarians and politicians must do. Now I want to make really uh, some comments about the international dimension of what we're talking about here today which is really what the conference is about. The international one as I'm reminded when I walked around the port this morning was the Cod War between Iceland and UK. Here's international legislation that comes in called the uh, Law of the Sea, where economic zones of up to 200 miles will belong to the individual country. The real problem then in my fleets from my area in Hull used to come fishing here all the time in Iceland. And Iceland then decided that like Britain, we claimed the continental shells right. So you have a piece of international legislation and you say, ah, oh, we want the oil under that. But when it comes to saying to Iceland, is the fish on your continental shelf your part of your economic zone. That was disputed. We sent in warships. Government got involved. I came here, and I'm reminded it's nearly 40, getting on 40 odd years to intervene with the Prime Minister then, get a Prescott deal. What I call the Prescott deal, which eventually came about. But it was rejected by Mr. Callaghan. It was rejected. He sent a telegram around saying, disowning me with NATO countries. Isn't it interesting? Dr. Lunds, the Secretary General, Director General of the NATO was actively involved in an alternative agreement. That was the Americans more concerned about what happened its NATO base rather than the fish that was around Iceland. So to that extent, we did manage to get an agreement at the end of the day. And that is a conflict between two countries, this case, the United Kingdom uh, and Iceland, and showed that where two governments are intervening, intervention may not be just at the government level. It can be at people like me being the backbench level, using public opinion and pursuing an unpopular argument in my own constituency of Hull, where there were three MPs, the other two supported Britain. I said Iceland had a case, and we could argue the case 
Out of that, then, with public agreement, came what I thought was uh, a just agreement. I see it's all starting again with mackerel, but leaving aside uh, that <laughs> argument, no doubt you'll get into it. Um, so the breakdowns of those talks, you were able to intervene and play a part. But there are always other parties, in that case, the Americans. There is a colonial dimension to this business of it. My first visit as a member of parliament in 1970 was to Sudan, which I heard the minister referring to this morning. Yes, the Sudan, that came out of a colonial decision to actually decide that Arab countries and African countries would be put together and called the Sudan. It became a civil war, and it's a civil war continuing today. Back in 1970, still here today as a problem, as mentioned really, that came out of that colonial problem. And indeed, let me mention the Falklands, still another colonial problem. Let me say, I never supported the invasion of Falklands and made it clear at the time my own seafarers were involved in that operation. I thought it was wrong. We failed to take the proper action to avoid it under both Labour governments and Tory governments because it came over the period of those times. Yet I'm reminded that Falklands and intervention sometimes can be very uh, uh, beneficial to politicians. I've just come from the hysteria in Britain about the death of Margaret Thatcher. You can see I'm probably not sharing it. But what is an unpopular prime minister gained popular by an intervention in Falklands, whether that was right or, or wrong. And therefore, to that extent, I oppose the invasions by the Argentines. What do you do in that case? If there's a military intervention, as happened in Cyprus, what is the reaction then? What can you justify? I think in this situation, whilst it was a colonial possession, I don't think it was justified to actually... Um, uh, a, a military invasion. But, you know, Britain had to react. It did, and it made a politician very uh, famous. That is in the Falklands. In the Caic, you probably don't know the other argument of a colonial one, which is the Caicos Islands, Diego Garcia. That is something that Britain, under a Labour government in 1960s, did a deal with the Americans to actually give this island over to Americans so they can bomb from there and use it to, say, take their um, alleged terrorists to the Cuban area, of course, to be able to be dealt with um, as terrorist activities, kidnapped as they were. So this island had 2,500 uh, islands. It's the same as the Falklands. The Falklands have just been asked to have a referendum. Well, they themselves decided to referendum. Should it remain a British colonial power? Well, in reality, it's still a, co a colonial procession. It's part of what, if you like, the United Nations, she should have self-determination. Self-determination apparently doesn't reply, uh, apply to the Caicos Islands, largely because even though the citizens are still British, they were removed completely from the island. 2,500 people, no rights whatsoever, completely sent from the island in order to give this possession to the Americans to carry out what, to my mind, was illegal activities and an offence against human rights. I'm still campaigning. That deal has to be settled again after 50 years, whether it's to be renewed. It's quite wrong for it to be, and that's one of the campaigns I'm actively involved in. So all these issues are pressures for change, which is important. Can I just say one or two words about change from my experience? It's becoming increasingly turned. It was being mentioned today. There's a kind of a, a wonderful democratic model that every world should follow. Democracy. Um, human rights, all those things. And we turn troops in in the name of defiance and human rights and implementing the more democratic society. I just wonder, as a person who's the chairman of the China Task Force set up by Blair and the Chinese Prime Minister, and I've been to China 30 years, I just wonder, in the process of industrialization, not only in China but elsewhere, there does seem to be an element when we consider our history that some of these civil rights and democratic rights really come after periods of struggle in the process of industrialization. It doesn't come by somebody invading, then putting in a democratic plant and saying it will automatically take place. Even the UN's not able to enforce that kind of authority. So I do wonder sometimes the justification for some of these things is that we want a Western model imposed in these countries. It almost takes us back a thousand years to the... Um, the, the, the wars that were taking place then uh, to impose what they saw in, in, in these countries, the Western kind of religion uh, model, a kind of uh, one that I didn't think worked then. And I does raise questions about the justification for interventions in these matters.
And therefore I find, and looking at the problems and the process of change that's taking place in some of these countries, do we need to consider that whether military intervention, however justified or not, and sometimes it's by nations and not UN, as we know with Iraq, do we have then the responsibility to use military power to replace the regimes that are working against their own people, committing atrocious acts, etc.? Is it then sufficient justification to the argument that you should do that? Now, I find it interesting as countries go through different processes, as a person who's the Rapporteur in the Council of Europe on matters of human rights and to I had to visit a country called Armenia, which was a communist country like China that has gone through a process of change. They are making change, but it took us 150 years or so in Western countries to develop what we call the kind of democratic model of today and doesn't take fully into account the history and the culture of these countries. Now, that's understandable, but what I begin to worry about, if you want to military intervene to justify these kind of actions and have in your mind that model, well, just look at Iraq before you start thinking whether that's easily achieved. Shock and awe of military may give you one thing, but the cultural development and religions and cultures in those countries, it's much more difficult to come along and say, we've got a new model for you. So to that extent, let me take Armenia. I was given the responsibility as the rapporteur to go to Armenia and observe their elections. That was in 2008. I observed the election. They were a new member of the Council of Europe. They entered into the obligation to observe human rights. But what happened? There was an election. Certain parties didn't like the result. There was a riot. The police killed, killed, killed 10 people. And 130 people were thrown into jail for threatening the security of the state. Now, clearly what happened there was clear breaches of their obligations under the Council of Europe. I was sent in, and I must say to that extent, they agreed that. What was important in getting changes, I got the 130 out of jail. I changed the laws, got them to change their laws on public interest, press freedom, all the things that we are feel is the framework of a more democratic society as defined by the Council of Europe in its Euro obligations and observed and agreed to by Armenia. So I was able to use those pressures to get a fundamental change in Armenia. Um, that was done in a continental way, that we agreed to the European Charter, you signed up to be a member. In fact, to be a member of the European Union is the same obligation to observe it. And then what do we find? that uh, yes, we got the change, but in my country, in Britain, we were having a damn big argument about whether prisoners should have the right to vote. In reality, it is a requirement, it's a disenfranchising of prisoners having a vote. Now, there is discretion of how you might deal with it, but that has led now to one member, the United Kingdom, calling to leave, basically these are the minority at the moment, but it grows, to leave Europe because of the obligations on human rights. Well, on the other hand, I'm negotiating in Armenia by the requirement they must be a member and observe these obligations and are able to bring an effective change in a country going through a process of different change. And I think that's what concerns me, is that what we expect of these countries to accept an almost the kind of the model of uh, definite Western model that we should implement seems to justify a number of interventions. On the international side, it has been pointed out the difficulties of the UN in imposing and the Security Council. They are real difficulties, it's just been pointed out there. But even in Iraq, when you were talking, if you could get UN obligation, uh, that was what Tony Blair believed. But the UN is the right way and approach. It has its weaknesses. I've found in climate negotiation changes. It's all right to get them all in a room and talk about it, come to an agreement. When they go back to their own countries, it becomes very difficult to clearly deal with the problems that you agree within an international framework, which is usually the lowest consensus. That's how you get the agreement, basically. So to that extent, there is a real problem on the UN. There is a real problem about its membership. There is a real problem on how your process of negotiation not only just at the security level, but also in the membership of 196 countries finding a common agreement. So I agree with what's been said about how we strengthen that, and that is obviously one way to do it. The other way, of course, to that extent, it does require you to get the UN to agree. In the UN case in regard to Iraq and Saddam, it was clear they agreed with Saddam, uh, agreed uh, with the invasion of Iraq to get rid of Saddam, or to get rid... Saddam out of, um, out of Kuwait. So to that extent, it's a rule, but when they went in to 
further into uh, Saddam and Iraq itself, there was no UN for that. Now, I just want to share with you the kind of discussions I was involved in with Tony Blair, who was constantly going back into to America, talking with President Bush about this. It was no doubt to my mind that Tony Blair certainly believed that in fact, it was possible to secure the UN negotiations for intervention. He thought Saddam was an evil man. He thought it was necessary to move in. There was genocide occurring in Iraq. All those things we talk about. And he then was really furious that he couldn't get an intervention. But he wanted agreement with UN. Why did he want this agreement with UN? He had observed in opposition Rwanda and seen that the UN had failed to do anything about it. Mass genocide, the world looking the other way, UN not able to do anything. Can you just watch and observe and do nothing and just protest? Certainly that was a very powerful influence on him, but he began to feel you had to do more. In regard to Iraq, he did hope that that was President Bush wanted and agreed to go along the UN route. And indeed, he offered the business of the other great problem, having a roadmap for Palestine and Israel. He went further than Clinton Bush did. It was hoped that this could be part of solving another great problem in Palestine and Israel. Of course, like most American people, he wasn't able to achieve anything on the Israel side, Palestine. But basically, he believed that. I must say, I came back from America having met President Cheney and talking to some of my Democratic friends. It was quite clear to me, whatever they felt about the UN, the Americans had no intention of uh, being involved in the UN. They didn't believe the UN could do anything. They saw the weaknesses, but they were convinced also that they should intervene. Why should they intervene? Of course, it had the terrible incident that occurred, a uh, terrible tragedy, really, of the uh, planes on the international buildings. But it was quite clear from my discussions with them and President Cheney, uh, Vice President Cheney, who quite clearly had no intention whatsoever to go the U UN route, that it was business as usual. Namely, we hadn't finished Saddam when you'd finished at Kuwait where you had the UN sanction, then we have to do it. And Tony then was trying to persuade them in this because Saddam were in breach of about 17 UN res resolutions. He felt you could go along and act. And eventually the Americans' business as usual was the very way they went. But you know, Tony always believed as he'd intervened in Sierra Leone, in Kosovo, all of that was without UN intervention, but it did prevent ethnic cleansing. It did deal with the problem we're talking about. Of course, it didn't have the authority of the United Nations. And therefore, Tony believed that no real or dictator has a right to treat his people in the sort of things we've been talking about on genocide. So what did it become? It became the core coalition of the willing. And that, in fact, wasn't justified, but that's, in fact, what happened. And eventually, we went in to um, into Iraq. Now, in those circumstances, it seems to me that really it was regime change. I mean, that was the accusation at the time, the belief that some of us had that perhaps we were prepared to use the UN, give the authority to the UN. Once the UN and its veto process decided it wouldn't, you then got into that same situation, which our separate colleague is talking about as well, is there is a justification. Now, what we've got is justification in these areas by nation states that have decided for whatever reason. Mali is yet another kind of example. But if you look at Libya, if you look at Syria, if you look even at Iran, the argument now comes, they've got different arguments. It may be nuclear, sanctions are failing. It becomes a justification then to intervene, simply because what is really which they don't like to you is regime change. Now, the reality is, if you say that's wrong, are you prepared to live with the idea that some leaders are still about actually committed these grave criminal offences against people to continue in that culture that exists there? Well, I have to say to a certain extent, what we see witnessing now is interventions in the sense using the rockets and the destructive technological uh, weapons that we've got. And indeed, uh, the drones, and use, which seem to kill more civilians, women and kids, than actually led terrorism that act. What the image, to my mind, which was so horrific, was to see President Obama sitting with his generals, almost playing a video game on Bin Laden, get him now, all sitting around, whether can we get him? Can we kill this man now? Not bring for the courts, never get him for human rights or whatever it might be, just kill him. Regime change, it wasn't entirely a regime, but it was a terrorist that had to be done. Now, is that what international action has now come about? 
I agree with what people have said about the Court of Criminal Justice and dealing and developing that. That is the way forward. Your conference is talking about that. But I do worry that what we begin to see now is it's encouraged to intervene on the basis of regime change. Now, we have to ask ourselves if you don't agree with that, are you prepared to see some of these countries where these offences are taking place? I say, yes, the criminal court, they're the ones that we need to be after doing. And in fact, I don't know whether the individual politicians in the nation state can be done. I do know the Prime Minister in Iceland got himself into difficulty over economic decisions. And where they decided that became a criminal action. Bit of an ongoing situation at the moment. But also the ex-Prime Minister, I think it was in, in um, you may, um, Damn, gone from my head now. She's been put in jail simply for an economic decision, right? So to that extent, what worries me is, yes, what you do and what we do here today is absolutely important. Politicians seeking to intervene it seem to be moving over to now that the justification now is if a number of uh, nations get together in the coalition of the willing, and if the society you don't like, whether it's North Korea, whether it's Syria, whether it's Libya, uh, all these countries, or even Iran, that the argument might be something to do with nuclear, and I understand the argument, but if they don't agree with what you want to do, are you entitled to make a military intervention? And that seems to me the justification that slid into Iraq of regime change is now almost becoming the criteria which will undermine the UN because it's not able to do anything because of the veto in the Security Council. So it's not a very uh, good situation. I hope that in giving you some of my indications as a, somebody who's a practitioner in trying to achieve the objectives we talk about and the difficulties of achieving it, I think we are at the crossroads now as to whether regime change is the motivation for military intervention. I don't believe it is. We should make clear it's not. But the alternatives are not easy to uh, advocate but we must still continue to do so. But it does worry me that the justification and seeing how with Blair and myself, seeing how what was right under NUN rules slides into a situation that becomes regime change, which is not. So you deny regime change right at the beginning in the discussions, Tony and I, in these arguments. I always said it's UN, it cannot be regime change. And then all of a sudden the troops are in, the shock and awe, and what is left? Absolute chaos. People and civilians, women and kids, feeling the consequence of the destruction of whatever security they had under whatever dictator. Is that a better way, or do we watch on television all these people being driven out of their countries, living in chaos, with various political and military militias going around committing murder? That can't be the alternative. It might not be attractive to the liberal mind to see these dictators still existing but giving a kind of level of security that many of those civilians feel was better than the one through military intervention and the coming of chaos that we saw in Iraq and will undoubtedly and is occurring in Syria now and other countries. This is not a justification for dictators. It's the practical problems of asking, what do you want at the end of the day? It's the individual human rights about. How do we protect their rights? How can they live in peace and security? How can we get them into a democratic frame? But you're dealing with countries who are not at the same economic and democratic development as Western countries are. Western countries seem to come along and say, this is the model, do it, or you're a country we can't accept, and it will justify military intervention. It cannot, it does not, and now I don't believe it. for a very spirited and, um, and uh, uh, personal, personal talk, colorful and personal, ranging from the Cod Wars to the Iraq War and, uh, and other uh, issues as well, but at the same time bringing up many critical issues about uh, that we will discuss at this conference, regime change included, and w in what circumstances military interventions can be justified. Uh, we now have uh, about 50 minutes for discussion, and uh, I would like uh, uh, I would like the uh, uh, those in the audience who want to to pose questions to introduce themselves and be as as brief and concise as possible when when posing those questions. <laughs>
Uh, thank you. My name is Marifeli Perez Estable. I was born in Cuba, but have lived in the United States uh, most of my life. And I actually have a, a, a brief question about non-state actors, but uh, Deputy Prime Ministers, um, uh, the Deputy Prime Ministers uh, talk about the United States and Iraq. I didn't hear anywhere the fact that the Bush administration lied about weapons of mass destruction, about a mushroom cloud, and that that really played into the fears of the American people. So the, the Congress had passed a regime change act in 98 or 99, and Clinton had signed it. But at any rate, mm, mm, the question about non-state actors, I understand that all these UN um, statutes are about state actors, but in conflicts like Colombia, where non-state actors are the primary responsible individuals for the atrocities, or in a much less uh, well-known case, in Peru during the Shining uh, Star movement, it was the the guerrillas who were the primary perpetrators. So does the United Nations have anything to say about that? I just want to. Yeah. Um, I think if we, if we look at the Geneva Conventions, uh, we can find the answer to, uh, to your question, because the Geneva Conventions, uh, they talk about uh, both state actors and non-state actors. So. Uh, the uh, the um, uh, humanitarian law that is included uh, in uh, the Geneva Conventions uh, uh, are ap applicable to both uh, state agents and non-state agents. Uh, otherwise, all these uh, uh, cases that you have mentioned in Latin America, in uh, uh, in Africa, or in uh, many other parts of the world uh, would have uh, uh, remained uh, unaccounted. Uh, uh, for, uh, uh, but based on the Geneva Conventions, uh, uh, these rules of humanitarian law and uh, protection of civilians applies to both uh, state and non-state agents. Can I just say something about that nuclear? I mean nuclear, but whether the country wants to secure um, nuclear proliferation weapons and whether they've signed the UN one and the non-proliferation is one aspect, right? But in reality, we double talk about it. Why was there not a complaint about India and Pakistan that were signatories to this getting the nuclear weapon? Why is it we're not prepared to say Israel, face up to its responsibility, say she got a nuclear weapon? And then the people in the, West, in the Middle East countries begin to say Iran. Libya, Tony Blair convinced him to dump all his uh, research and development into nuclear weapons. Would Libya have been invaded if she had a nuclear weapon? I mean, these are the lessons that are being taught by having two kind of standards on nuclear weapons. And if Iran, I grew up as a lad 11, listening to Britain that had been involved in nuclear weapons during the war, when the Americans refused to give license to have the, uh, they had most of the research there. So we developed our own bomb because we recognized that was part of the international influence to that extent. Now, that, what, what they argued in Britain at the time was we need nuclear energy whilst developing the, all the equipment are necessary for a nuclear weapon. It may be, though they deny it, Iran is doing the same thing. But it does raise the question, is that a legitimate reason for intervention? If it's a possible nuclear weapon, you can be damn sure they won't go in, right? And in North Korea today, the reality of North Korea, and I know from the Chinese negotiators that I was involved in on Iran and they were negotiating with the Koreans, the big issue is about America releasing financial resources that it has in sanctions against, new, uh, against Korea. Korea is not going to invade them. What they want is the Americans to recognize in negotiations between them, which I think is difficult for America, but at the heart of this dispute is that issue of sanctions and whether North Korea can get its money back. And in the meantime, they play big, threaten insecurity, because the Americans won't negotiate. I mean, to a certain extent, this isn't an, an anti-American. You know, very much involved with America, admire a great deal of things they do. But is nuclear sanctions now? If nations say you can't have nuclear weapons, 
Only us goodies can have nuclear weapons. Suspected baddies can't. It's a double standard that leads to great intervention. And if it's now used as a reason for military intervention, because in regard to Iraq, all our intelligence agencies told us quite clearly that yes, there was. I don't think there was now, looking at the evidence, but that's what we were told at the time, and Tony Blair took that on board. It was wrong. So if you took away that, what was the justification for going into Iraq if it simply wasn't that of Saddam? Indeed, as the American senators told me at the time, and their military people, they were already preparing for war. They tolerated what Blair was trying to do as a kind of acceptable face in Europe, which turned out not to be so acceptable. Business as usual. American interest, American intervention. And Bush even made clear to Blair, you don't really have to come with us. After all, we don't really need you. But it does look an alliance of the willing. Okay. Any other questions? Hello, my name is Katrin Ostadir, and I'm just back from the dentist, so I might speak a little bit <laughs> weird. <laughs> uh, I just heard the last lecture, and thank you very much, and thank you for hosting this conference, which seems very interesting. But I would like to add maybe to the last question from the audience. Uh, uh, now, children in Iraq are born with deformities uh, because of chemical weapons used in those interventions. And the children there who are born uh, retarded or with great deformities are, are many times more likely to be born in Iraq today than after the nuclear attacks in Japan. So I was wondering, the Geneva Conventions, they don't offer any protect to those kids, uh, and, and they're even designed to prevent war crimes. So I would just like to get a, a, per, a, or a, a stance from maybe Mr. Perscott, because he's been talking about this. Uh, how can chemical weapons be used in interventions which are done in the name of human rights? Well, of course, that was one of Tony Blair's argument that uh, Saddam did use chemical weapons and weapons of mass destruction, whether they had the nuclear then, or clearly did in its early days, because the Israelis destroyed their early stages of nuclear development. But the use of chemical weapons, genocide against the Kurds, was clearly committed. This man did do that. Now that's an interesting question for what I'm saying. Is that still a justification for a military intervention? Short answer is yes. Yeah, pardon? Yes. What, like you did in Iraq? Yes. Well, it's a bloody mess for the people afterwards, isn't it? Uh, but it was not okay what happened. No, I agree, that is event. the dilemma for us. But who yes. suffer most from it? Who suffer most? The What's happened in Iraq since? Kurds and all other people under Saddam Hussein. No, you're right. Quite obvious. But what about the whole people in Iraq? Look, I agree it's a dilemma. That's what I'm trying to post here. We can all sit back and say, yes, it justifies it wonderfully. Then you send in the troops and all the chaos that comes from that. At that stage, at the end of the day, you have to hope the people will get rid of them or whatever way it is. But if it justifies without the UN, do you agree it's without the UN? Yes, because UN, as we have seen, UN Security Council is very often unable to act. So who look, makes look, the look, look at Syria. Look at Syria at the so, moment. Yeah, it's not okay decides? the Security Council is not able to make any decision. But who okay. decides that? Do a few of the willing get together and say we're going to do it? Yeah. Bloody hell. Yeah. Yes. God help us. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, the last question. Yeah. My name is Darnell Summers. I'm with the ICD. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I have a lot of things I could talk about, my own personal experience with wars of crimes against humanity. But what's upsetting me now is the fact that someone here doesn't seem to recognize it was the Germans who helped develop the uh, poison gas program in Iraq. It's been documented. It's clear. So when we talk about who's responsible and what to do about it, then all those people who share in culpability they have to be addressed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, now, sir, you were talking about, well, what tried to justify the, uh, uh, the military action against uh, Iraq, arguing with Mr. Prescott. Now, obviously, no one in here in this room would maintain that we should sit by idly and allow people to dispense chemical weapons or any other types of weapons of mass destruction against defenseless people. But I think it's important to point out who is responsible for the 
research, the R and D actually, yeah. and the acqui- and allowing the acquisition of these uh, weapons of mass destruction. Iraq alone did not build these weapons. There was the complicity of people in NATO. Period. Any comment on that? <laughs> Well, I agree that's part of the national action where you can support them. I think the gov- uh, hasn't the international just agreed about arms ex- um, exports or something like that? You have to do more and more of that. But I think the question posed, we know in our own country who's selling what kind of weapons and to where, and you can prosecute them in a way because those weapons are illegal in that sense. But I have to say to my colleague here, you know, What happened when Europe came together, East and West, it wasn't military action, was it? It might have been a military balance. It was a political solution that freed the rest of Europe from what were in a framework that they considered to be breaches of human rights. Should we have military intervened over NATO to achieve that? Yes. Or should we just... Uh, yes. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not very happy that uh, all the world just looked how Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania were occupied 50 years by Soviet Union yeah. and didn't act. I'm not happy about it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, but would military intervention be acceptable to you then? Yes. So the Western yes. nations should yes. have done an invasion? Yes, absolutely. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Will you agree it became a political agreement that sorted it out in the end? Do you think it's okay that Soviet Union occupied these countries and all, all other countries just were sitting and, and looked at it? 50 years. All the horrible genocide all the aggression against all the civilian people. It was not okay from my point of view. I think it was Hitler who intervened in a number of countries in the name of the German people's interest of living in that country. Led to a terrible consequence, I'm about to say. Okay, I think we will not solve this dispute here at this uh, forum. But I would like to thank all the contributors for very stimulating talks and also the audience for their participation. And uh, we will now uh, end this session and have lunch and we'll reconvene at 2.30 in the afternoon. Thank you.